Praise the Lord. This is Elder Henry Reinhardt, and I have an important message that I want to teach today, and part of this teaching is going to involve children, the subject of children. The, the entire message will by no means be only about children, but part of it will be about children. And let me say before I get started, I don't know how much longer teachings concerning children are going to be relevant for the children of God because we're living in the closing age. I'm of, I'm of the firm belief, this is just my belief, it's just... But I'm of the firm belief that the Lord will come for his church before another generation of children have been born and have been raised to a grown age. Because when I look around and I observe the things that are going on and I I'm cognizant of the Holy Scriptures and the things that Jesus said would be happening in this generation and the things that some of the apostles spoke to, I'm convinced that it's not going to be very long uh, before the Lord comes. I believe that the only things that are delaying the Lord's coming right now are his long-suffering and his mercy. The scriptures tell us that God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. The Lord takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. The Lord is very long-suffering. He has shown that again and again. But despite that, the time is going to come when the Lord will come. And when he does, it will be very swift. It will be very quick. The scriptures say in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, when he comes, there won't be any time to get ready. You've got to be ready now. Glory to God, and you've got to stay ready. Having said all that, I want to do this very important teaching today, and the teaching is entitled, Don't Lie to and Deceive Your Children. Train them up in truth, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and accountability. Again, the topic of my teaching today will be don't lie to and deceive your children. Train them up in truth, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and accountability. Now, you can regard this teaching I'm going to do today as both an admonishment and as an exhortation. I'm going to say that again. You, you can regard the teaching that I'm about to do today as both an admonishment and as an exhortation. I'm going to take... I'm going to take a moment here to go over the definitions of both of those things. First, I'm going to talk about admonishment. Admonishment is a firm warning or reprimand. It is to criticize or to warn gently but seriously. That's, an, that's what an admonishment is. An exhortation, on the other hand, 
is an address or communication emphatically urging someone to do something. It is to urge strongly. I, I think that both of those things are of, of enough importance that I wanted to take a moment there and just deal with the definition of both of those so that no one is left hanging or doubting what I was talking about when I said that I was going to deliver this teaching as both an admonishment and as an exhortation. Now, having said that, let's get to the teaching. When I was a child, my parents and many others in my community taught me that there was a tooth fairy. They taught me that there was a boogeyman. They taught me that there was an Easter Bunny. They taught me that there was a Santa Claus. And they taught me that there were ghosts, goblins, and any number of other beings. Being a small child at the time and and trusting in my parents and other older people, I believed them when they told me these things. As a young boy, I can remember being afraid to look under my bed because I believed that the boogeyman lived under my bed and that he would get me if I looked under there. Now this, this is partly because of the things I would, were, was being told by older people. I actually believed, and I can remember at a very young age, as if it were yesterday, I can remember being afraid to look under my bed, to get down and look under my bed on the floor because I actually believed that the boogeyman was under there, lived under my bed, and that he would get me if I looked up under my bed. Now, as, as, as ridiculous as that may sound to some of you, that's what I believed. And that it was because of some of the things that had been told me. Now, as young children, there is a time in our lives in which we have no knowledge between good and evil. And we are thus unable at that age, whatever that age may be, to discern between the truths of good and evil. God winks at this, and he excuses us as little children during this early childhood period. And he does not hold us, the young children, the very young children, he doesn't hold us accountable for the sins of our elders. As the Lord explained to Israel when they murmured and complained and falsely claimed that their little ones would be a prey, P-R-E-Y, would be a prey in the promised land. I want you to hear the, what I want you to hear what the Lord said. And this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39. 
God said this, Moreover, your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day, pay attention to this, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither. And unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. The Lord was letting Israel, the grown people, the older people, he was letting them know that since you said this, that, that the young children were going to be a prey, I'm not going to hold them accountable to the foolishness that you were saying concerning them because they were not of a sufficient age yet to have a knowledge between good and evil. So I'm going to give the promised land to them. You're not going to go into it, but I'm going to give the promised land to the very ones whom you said that I was going to allow to be a prey when they went in. I read that because I wanted you to know that God himself recognizes in his word that little ones, as he called them, have no knowledge between good and evil until they have reached a point of maturity and learning to do so. Now, it's different. It's different for different children. Some children don't get to a sufficient age that they can discern, discern between good and evil and understand between good and evil until maybe eight or nine years old. Some may get to that point at the age of six or seven. And some, because of learning disabilities or whatever, may not understand these things until the age of, say, 12 or 13. So there's no certain age, no certain numerical age at which this will happen, but God knows the heart of each child, and God knows when they are at the point to which they can be held accountable to being able to discern good and evil. All that said, when I became a young adult and later a full-grown man, I learned that my parents and many others in my young childhood had lied to me concerning all those things I just talked about a while ago, you know, the tooth fairy, the boogeyman, the Easter bunny, Santa Claus, I learned that all those things were lies, lies. God doesn't make any difference between white lies and black lies, they're just lies. There's no such thing as a white lie to God. Lies are lies, and when grown-up folks are telling their children lies, they're doing something that God frowns upon. They're doing something that is sinful. It's a sin. Glory to God. And you keep that in mind as I go through this teaching. Glory to God. I eventually learned the difference between good and evil, and I and I and I I was able to discern that at at a comparatively young age. Amen. It didn't take me until the point that I was a young man. I learned that at a very early age, say six or seven years old. Amen. 
I was able to discern between good and evil and to know when something was a lie and when it was not. Amen. But, I'm, but what I'm saying is when I become a young adult, I certainly understood very clearly that my parents and other older adults, there was a period of my young life when they had just straight out lied to me and filled my head with a bunch of foolishness. Glory to God, which should not have been done. So, when I realized, when I learned the difference between good and evil, at that point, I had to make a decision. Personally, I had to make a decision as to whether or not I would continue believing in and participating and practicing the lies or whether I would repent of my previous error and practice and speak the truth. As I said earlier, there was a time when God did not hold me accountable in my very young age. He didn't hold me accountable for all the lies and you know the misconceptions that were in my young brain because of the lies that my parents and older people were teaching me. But once I got to the point of accountability, the age of accountability, and once I understood the difference and was able to discern the difference between good and evil, I had to make a decision. Every child has to make a decision once he gets to that point. Are you going to continue to believe the lies and to practice in the lies even though you know their lies now? You know their lies. Are you going to continue in that error? Or are you going to repent of that previous error, and are you going to begin to speak truth, not only speak it to yourselves, but are you going to speak truth to your children once you beget children as a father or have children as a mother? I decided, personally, I decided to start speaking truth. I decided to start teaching truth, I decided to depart away from all those lies that were taught to me when I was a very young child. <clears throat> I renounced from that point forward. I renounced the tooth fairy. I renounced the boogeyman. I renounced the Easter Bunny and all the other fictitious characters that were a product of my childhood teaching and indoctrination. And I refused, you hear me? I refused to teach them to my children once I begat children and was raising them. And I refused to teach them to anyone else's children. In the eyes of the Lord, there is no such thing as a good lie. I'm going to repeat that. See, because we have a whole lot of heresy and, and, and foolishness that is taught and is spoken from many mouths. Glory to God. But in the eyes of the Lord, there is no such thing as a good lie or a white lie. Glory to God. A lie to God is simply that. It's a lie. It's not true. And those of us who are spirit-filled children of God will be held accountable for lying to the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. I'm going to say that again. Those of us who are spirit-filled 
children of God, Holy Spirit-filled children of God, will be held accountable for lying to the Holy Ghost. Because, see, here, here's, here's the thing you got to understand. As a Spirit-filled child of God, when you tell a lie, whether it be to your children, whether it be to other adults, whether it be to fellow saints of God, whether it be to an unsaved person, when you tell a lie, you're not just lying to that person. You're lying to the Holy Ghost because you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. That was a very, very hard lesson learned by a husband and wife by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. And it's recorded in the Holy Scriptures. It's recorded, amen, in the book of Acts in the young church. Amen. Ananias and Sapphira had conspired together to lie. And, and the sad thing about it, they didn't have to do this. What it was in the early church, the saints of God, many of them were selling. Those of us who had, those of them, excuse me, who had houses and lands, they were, many of them were selling their houses and their lands, and they were bringing the proceeds from selling those things, and they were laying the money down at the apostles' feet. And the apostles, after that, were distributing to everyone so that no one had any need, no one lacked. But they were making sure that whatever people of God were there that lacked, that they got what they needed so that they wouldn't have to go without. Well, Ananias and Sapphira had some possessions which were theirs. Nobody forced them. And this is, this, is, this is important. At the time, nobody was forcing the saints to do this. The ones that did it, they did it of their own free will. The ones that chose to sell houses and lands and to get the money and bring it to the apostles' feet, they, would do it. they did this at their own free will. But Ananias and Sapphira decided they were going to be slick and that they were going to bring the money to the apostles, and they conspired together that they were going to lie and say that they had brought all of the money that they had that they got from selling these things and give them to the apostles. Well, what they did was they kept back, Ananias and Sapphira kept back part of the money instead of bringing it all. And they laid part of the money at the apostles' feet while claiming that they had brought it all. They were lying, in essence. They were lying, but they were claiming that they had brought it all. And so Ananias was the first one, the husband. He was the first one to come up and to lie. And when he laid the money at the apostles' feet. Peter, being an apostle, the Lord gave him the spirit of discernment at that time, and Peter was able to discern that Ananias was lying. And Peter asked him, why has Satan, listen to what Peter said, why has Satan filled thine heart? Glory to God to lie to the Holy Ghost. And he said, you, you, you haven't lied to men. He's, he's talking, this is Peter talking to Ananias. He says, you, you haven't lied to men, but you have lied to God. You have lied to God. And while Peter was in the midst of saying these things, Ananias gave up the ghost. He fell dead. God brought immediate judgment upon Ananias for lying to the Holy Ghost, for lying to the Spirit of God. God brought immediate death, judgment, and Ananias fell down dead at 
at the words of Peter. Amen. And the scripture says, great fear came upon the church after what was done. So they came in, the young man, the scripture says, came in, wound him up, wound Ananias up, took him out, and took him to his burying place. Well, a little while later, Sapphira, who was not with Ananias when he came in the first time, Sapphira comes in to the house of God, and when she comes in, the apostle Peter asks her, is it true, Sapphira, that, you know, you sold the land for this and that, and that you brought everything? And Sapphira says, oh, yeah, yes, yes, it's true. Glory to God. And Peter looked at her again with the spirit of discernment that the Lord was using in him. And Peter asked her, why? Why, Sapphira, have you agreed with your husband to lie? Glory to God. He said, Behold, the ones that took your husband out, see, because Sapphira, she didn't know anything about all this that had happened with her husband yet. She didn't know about this. But he said, Behold, the feet of the one who took your husband out and buried him, they shall take you out. And soon as Peter was done speaking, Sapphira fell dead and gave up the ghost. And of course, great fear came upon all the church when they heard what had happened. Glory to God. But, I, I use that scriptural, that scriptural example to show you that God is not playing with us. Now, at that point in the early church, God took their lives immediately. They were put to death. Immediate judgment came upon them. Today, in the church of Jesus Christ, it may not happen to you immediately. You may not fall dead and give up the ghost immediately. But, if you lie to the Holy Ghost, and if you continue in a life of lying to your children, lying to others, you are going to face eternal damnation. Glory to God. No liars are going to enter heaven. The scripture says all liars, pay attention, pay attention to what I'm saying. All liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. All liars, all liars, glory to God. So we, we, we need to understand this, and we need to, we need to take this stuff seriously. We need to take this stuff seriously, saints. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, glory to God. Our body. If you're, if you're filled with God's Spirit, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. God actually comes within us and abides, lives within us. Our bodies become His temple. Glory to God. And when we lie, we are defiled filing that temple. And again, all liars, all liars. The last time I checked, all means everything, everybody without exception. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Now, Elder Henry Reinhardt didn't say that. That's not... <laughs> That's not Elder Henry Reinhardt's word. Glory to God. God said it. From Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. 
we're told all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's a very serious thing. True spirit-filled children of God are supposed to be different. We're supposed to be holy. We're supposed to be sanctified, meaning sanctified means set apart for holy purpose. We're supposed to be sanctified and meet for the master's use. We are not supposed to think and act as the world does. And we are not to raise our children according to the standards and mores of the world system. So we're, not, we're not supposed to teach them to act as the world does and to think as the world does. We are to walk according to God's holy word as it is written and in doing so we will definitely suffer. We're going to suffer for it. We're going to suffer persecution. And we will be despised of men. For all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. We are told, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate. That's the sanctification part. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. This reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Now, I know that many of us don't want to suffer. And many of us don't want to be rejected by our so-called friends and our family. And we don't want to be ostracized by the world. So we go along with the world because of that. And we accommodate the world and its ways. In other words, we sell out. But, but let's... <laughs> Let's, let's dispense with all that and just cut to the chase. Many of us sell out. We sell out to the world because we don't want to suffer. We don't want to be ostracized. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to be despised. So many of us simply sell out to the world and go along with the world. Amen. When it comes to speaking the truth and lying. So let me, let me warn you that when you do this, when you sell out like this, you set yourself up to be an enemy of God. Did you hear that? Did you hear me? Did you hear me clearly? I, I'm going to say it again. When, when you do these things, when you sell out to the world, when you become a liar with them, when you are in agreement with them because you don't want to suffer, you don't want to be ostracized, you don't want to be despised, when you do that and when you live like that, you make yourself an enemy of the Lord. You need to understand how serious this is. You make yourself an enemy of God. You set yourself up to be an enemy of the Lord. For it is written, I want you to hear this. It's written, this is written. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity? 
enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. This comes from James chapter 4, verse 4. I'm going to read it again because I want you to, I want you to get this. I want you to get this, and I want you to realize how serious this is when we live a life filled with lies, when we lie to our children, when we lie to our fellow man, when we lie to our fellow saints. Glory to God. We're taking a position against God. We're setting ourselves up as the enemy of God. And I want you to realize how serious this is. Now to read it again, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. This is written. The Elder is not making this up. This is written. James chapter 4, verse 4. When we befriend the world in order to avoid persecution and rejection, we become God's enemy. So, you need to make your choice. You need to make your choice. And realize that the wrong choice can lead to eternal damnation for you. There is nothing. Listen, listen. There is nothing, no thing on this earth more serious than our walk with the Lord. I don't, care what it, I don't care what it is. There's nothing nothing more serious, nothing more important. Glory to God. If you want to make it in, you can't allow mother, father, sister, brother, uncle, auntie, cousin, grandparents, husband, wife, if you're serious about making it in, if you're serious about being rapture ready, if you're serious about being in eternity in peace with Jesus Christ, glory to God. You've got to understand that there's nothing more serious and more important than our walk with God in holiness and righteousness and godliness. The scriptures tell us, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Glory to God. The only ones that are going to be with Jesus in eternity and in peace are going to be those that are holy. God said, be ye holy, for I am holy. God demands, God demands holiness. And a big part of holiness is speaking and living truth, not lying. Glory to God. We must learn to take this very seriously. We must learn that God is not plain. And we must learn that if we want to truly be the friend of God, glory to God, we must reject the world. We must reject its custom. We must reject, glory to God, the standards and the mores of the world. Glory to God. We live in a day where, and I really, I really feel sorry. I feel sorry for those that have little children, especially those that have school age children. Because our world has gotten to the point where they're actually allowing so-called drag queens, homosexuals, defiled people to come in to the classroom. 
homes and to parade around and to fill your child's head with a bunch of foolishness. Glory to God. And to parade around and present themselves as something that is acceptable, as something that's normal. It's not normal. And it's not acceptable. And it should never be deemed normal and acceptable to a spirit-filled child of God. You've got to take a stand. Glory to God. God help you to have enough guts to take a stand, to have enough godliness in you to take a stand. What I just mentioned, that's just that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's 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 truly, truly regrettable what's going on. Amen. And this nation, the United States as a whole has become so corrupt. Right is being called wrong. Wrong is being called right. Glory to God. They're telling the lie that there is no such thing as absolute truth. Glory to God. That's a lie. That's a lie from Satan. Straight from the pit of Satan's abode. That's a lie. Glory to God. But these are the kinds of things that are being said. Glory to God. And you've got to make a choice. You've got to, we should be the last ones to teach our children lies, just straight out lies. We should be the last ones to raise our children. Glory to God, to believe the lies. Glory to God, and to have them defiled with all kinds of foolishness. Glory to God. You've got to make a choice. You got to make a choice. Are you going to take a stand? Are you going to be holy? Are you going to be sanctified? Are you going to be different? Are you going to come out from among them and be you separate? Or are you just going to give in because you don't want to suffer? Or are you just going to give in? Glory to God and take a part with the world. You got to make a choice. Amen. God bless you. May your choice be the right one. May you side with God. You got to take sides. God has taken sides and you've got to take sides. God is standing with his people, with those that are truly his, with those that truly want to be holy, those that truly want to live a sanctified life, those that truly want to glorify him. God's already made his choice. You've got to make a choice. May you make the right one. God bless you.